this is going to be just very difficult for you. We should just bring Ken Matson in here. He can grill me. Totally Doesn't he do your horses? Doesn't he, he shoot your horse? I thought Ken and I were pretty good and, and, and close, but I guess I'm just uh, no good to him. Shop liver. Shop liver, right? <laughs> uh, let's see here. So I want, I want to start off with this from the uh, Facebook comment community. So you, you know already, you're, you're under the radar here. Under the, um, I should say under the microscope. Sure. Uh, Jackie Long, wish there would have been more efforts put into the school discipline bill. Jeff Haddock's commented the mostly incompetent legislature is still more about the money than affecting the lives of the most vulnerable. Ken Matson then chimed in, very observant. Completely disagree. I think the, uh, you know, Jackie is right. We, we did put a lot of work into our school discipline bill. It was third, uh, about third from the end. And if it wasn't for a Democratic uh, filibuster towards the end, I think we would have passed that. It was a very comprehensive uh, discipline bill that included uh, elementary schools. We'd worked a long time on it on both sides of the House uh, and the Senate. Um, it'll be ready to go instantly in the next session. And I hope maybe even in, 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 the, in the special session, because I know it was important to leadership. It was important to the Senate. So we did work long and hard on, on that discipline bill. And we, we and quite frankly, we had a lot of other bills uh, through education. Uh, we also had a great bill for, for foster care children uh, that did get through the finish line uh, that Adam Burkhammer and Jonathan Pinson led uh, that is creating this uh, platform, digital platform, to bring all of those records and things uh, for the foster care kids so that you can have access to to records and things like that. So, I, you know, I disagree with those comments that those folks aren't there and they don't know all the bills that passed. And I have a pretty good understanding of, you know, what bills passed in every single piece of uh, whether it comes to health, education, economic development, whatever it is. From the outside looking in, most of us think of something as a common sense item that should pass. Yeah. When you get into the Capitol and there are 100 different brains working on something, there's a complication in what you might regard as common sense versus what somebody else might. Yeah, you've got 100 alpha personalities with everybody's got their own idea. And even if it is a very simple bill that everybody wants, um, unfortunately, the, the horse trading and if, if the Senate knows that a bill is important to the House, they might hold it back just to ensure some of their important bills get run to. So unfortunately what happens is you get to the end of a session and some of those bills are now sitting there on the waiting, you know, on, on the sideline, and we're trying to get them through. We had a good 30 bills not get actually uh, passed on the last night because we just ran out of time. And, and for whatever reason, you know, a bill could go for two hours on, on discussion and debate and that might be a reason somebody wants a bill to run for two hours because they don't want another bill coming down the road. And th that's, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats. It's a poker game is what it you're saying. It really mm -hmm. is, yes. Right? Yeah. What are the education bills that you were able to get through on the Education Committee? So I think uh, one of the big things, we had a meeting with the Berkeley County uh, Board of Education a um, couple of months back, and one of their things was the professional development. Why do they have to do this professional development every single year? Um, we managed to pass um, House Bill 4830, which allows teachers now to only do professional development every three years. So I, that was a big ask from the, the local BOE, and we got that passed. Um, the other BOE, uh, local board of education bill that we passed was the impact fees, uh, and that Height and I worked, and Summer worked really hard on that, and uh, I think that's going to be huge for Berkeley County. So uh, Berkeley County got some big wins in their, in their Board of Education. Uh, talk about the impact fees for a moment. I know that wasn't uh, a bill that you wrote, but you did Well, we you, did. You did lobby it. We did write it, but it did never you part, did. you take part in writing it? Yes. Oh, okay, never uh, mind. So we, we wrote a House version, and then we had the Senate version come from the other side, too. Uh, the House version didn't get far, um, but once the Senate version passed, I think Summer put all her efforts in, and then Height and I really uh, went to work working on uh, the Governor or uh, Committee Chair. All right, so the, it is the Senate bill, then. So it's not the it bill, is a Senate bill. It's not the bill you wrote, but parts of what it's, you wrote in there? It's the exact same bill as what we wrote. 
Okay, it so just came from the Senate. Senate. There's a lot of misunderstanding about impact fees because yes. the thought right now is that impact fee fees will apply to every single newly home no. new, new home construction in Berkeley County. That's not the case. It is only for multiple um, homes for developers. So it can't be a one one off house. If you're building building your own house, uh, it's not going to affect you at all. But if you're in a subdivision, it if, might. If you're in a major subdivision, 100 houses, it may. Uh, there are a litany of, of uh, items that have to be ticked off by the uh, Berkeley County Commission before they can do it, and they are the ones who will decide what those impact fees are. So it is just a permissive bill. I'm, I, I've been talking to the county commission. They are well aware that they don't want to stifle growth or um, do that, but they, this is a way for the county to, re, to implement an impact fee so that we can get money to our schools and our, our, our uh, fire services and emergency services. This does not affect existing homes. It does not affect any if, existing homes. If you're moving home. down the block to a house that has been built in 1970, this doesn't affect you. Absolutely not. So the impact fees are collected. Does it follow the same formula that the taxes do? 82% goes to the schools and the 18% goes to the county commission, or is this a different pot? I think it, don't quote me, I think it, it follows the same kind of um, thing, but they have a little more um, leeway in how they can collect those. So they could say, hey, we, we want to use it for fire services or we want to use it for schools. Or, um, but yes, definitely for, for education and emergency services. All right. Go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to ask the question, if there is a development, say, that has already been approved, this is not yet in place, but this development, while the approval may have come, may be two years down the line before ground is broken for the first time. Will it be retroactive once it does go into place? That no, I don't think it can be retroactive. Okay. I think once a development is approved, it's already gone through the Planning Commission, right. and then that it's already kind of got there. This would be for future development that's coming to, to Berkeley County. And again, Berkeley County Commission, the mm -hmm. people that we elect in the commission, can make those rules and decide exactly what it's for and who it's, it's doing. It's a local control bill, um, but it was one that the Board of Education was ver very adamant. They sent us a letter. Um, we got it across the finish line. Um, we got the uh, Teacher's Bill of Rights um, com completed. Um, we also got training for the um, elected Board of Education members. Uh, more financial training so they can really look into the finances of their specific BOE. So I, I thought that was important because, again, elected officials can come from any walk of life you know, with no, no qualifications. Mm -hmm. So this just helps them understand the school aid formula, how that works, mm -hmm. where the money's going, what money you're actually getting, what money you're um, allowed to use for, for which purpose. I, I want to talk now as a constituent. You are, you are my delegate. I am. And I, I, I want to thank you for the things that you guys got through for Berkeley County. I know you'll have a special session coming up in a couple of months. What are your top items that you are looking to see come across the finish line then that will directly benefit your constituents, the people of Berkeley County? So I, I think with special session, I, I know the governor's the one who kind of puts the stuff on the agenda, but I, I do think getting money back into the IDD waiver, I know we, we pulled that out last minute. And I didn't quite understand why we were taken away from the, the, those communities. We're underpaying those those people anyway. Um, Mike Heights a lot more familiar with it th than I am, but um, I didn't understand why we were cutting there. I think this will enable us to put that money back into those services. Um, so I think there will be some special appropriations in this session. I don't know how many actual bills the governor, because what happens is the governor will decide what's on the agenda. Um, and that's not my phone. Um, so he'll decide what's on the agenda and, and what is actually in play. So it'll be up to him. I hope he listens to the House. And Hold on, John's got an, John's got to answer. Do we need to answer that, John? <laughs> is it the iPad? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even... Yeah, that was my iPad. My iPad has never rang before. I didn't even know it could. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry somebody about face, that. Somebody FaceTime with you. Maybe one of our listeners said, Siri, call John Bodwell's <laughs> iPad. <laughs> I bet, was, I bet it was Wayne Clark playing tricks on us again. <laughs> All right, you were in the middle of your your. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I think you know, for the special session, it's up to the governor what goes on mm -hmm. the agenda. So I don't have any say. He might put thirty bills on there, thirty initiatives. I hope he puts my plasma games on there. I think it'd be a big win for him. Um, What's that? 
That's the uh, chemical engineering through gaming uh, training for high schools. It's a fantastic program that's working really well down in South Carolina. I think, Governor, it would make a great play for your Senate run, just so you know. If you put that, throwing in, that in there, just throwing that in there, yeah. well, more uh, more technology training for kids. That's more, what we yeah, need. Exactly. And we, we, you know, our biggest export that we have in West Virginia, besides coal, is our, our children and our, our, our youth. And if we can keep some of those high paying jobs within West Virginia and get them educated, I think we're on well, the right I, track. I mean, unfortunately, we're we're sending a lot of our, our college graduates leave. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of the people who who don't, a lot of the people who don't become educated end up staying. I mean, we need to. We need to figure out a way to keep our, our to keep the, the people who are most motivated here in the state. Yeah, and this company ha, has a track record, and, and it, the success that's happening down in South Carolina is absolutely fantastic. Chemistry is not a sexy subject, uh, but this this is teaching chemistry in a way that makes it make, makes them realize they're not even learning; they're, okay. they're they're just doing it. The other great bill that I thought that we passed um, that came from Berkeley County was the multi-tiered system for school ad, absenteeism. So. Uh, I was working with the local truancy, truancy officer, and that bill came from the Senate side, but we amended in um, Kaylee's Law in there, which is the, uh, I believe it's Kaylee's Law, um, which is the pregnancy. Um, it, it, right now, some school systems were making girls come back to school 72 hours after having a baby. Thanks. So it just seemed ridiculous. So we put in into law, into code what needs to happen and what you can do as a, as a father and as a mother. Very good. Hey, good, uh, good man. I was just going to ask you to take me back to the, the school discipline bill. I was and, going there yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what were kind of some of the arguments against that didn't allow it to, to get to the finish so, line? Was this Amy Summers' bill? The no, school discipline bill no, or is it separate? No, no. I think this this was um, came out of the Education Committee. We were using the Senate version, a um, great uh, – Amy Grady. Amy Grady. That's Amy, my Amy Grady. Amy who, Grady. Yes, okay. the chair of uh, the chair of the Senate um, Education Committee. She was taking our discipline bill from last year, applying it to um, elementary schools, and then also making laying out the terms of what actually happens when you have a violent, let's say, a young man, a young lady, actually physically out, you know, hurts a teacher or does crazy you know throws chairs through windows things like Mm -hmm. where it's gone past so dangerous uh, dangerous yeah Yeah, i mean so it was a comprehensive bill that had everything that we were looking to do and i think we'll we'll pass it It, if it had got if we'd had the time we would have passed it it was third it was third up and ready to go Mm -hmm. um i know the uh Chair of the Dems did not like that bill, and I think that's why the filibustering started happening at the end. What was they, the reason for not liking it? Um, he did, he he really felt that the the bill hurt uh, minorities, and he didn't like the fact that um, the the police could be called at some point. And, and, and so he, he fought it through committee. Him and I did not see eye to eye on it on, on a lot. We had a very very um, how do we say, uh, harsh conversation outside of committee with each other. Um, but he fought it tooth and nail all the way through. So if there's violence, you know, the, the incidents of violence and stuff like that, he doesn't want to see the police involved. So, yeah, they, they couldn't ride the bus home. There were the, We laid it out in, in very specific terms, and it was very detailed. So the first defense, you know, punching somebody or something and it went through the whole and then it got to the point where let's say the child bit the teacher or attacked the teacher you know there were things and, and in the end it was you know child protective services and the police could be involved if the parents didn't want to come pick up their children so if we couldn't get a hold of thing we'd, we'd inform law, law enforcement it wasn't hey we're calling the police you're going to get arrested they are already um things in place for high schools and, and some middle schools this bill took it all the way down to the elementary uh, level because teachers have been complaining about discipline for years mm-hmm. it's the number one priority and it's not just in high schools it's in yeah. it's in it's in elementary schools it's in middle schools too well and i think that also serves a little bit as a deterrent to kids i mean if you know there, that the police can yeah. be involved you know you may back off a little yeah, I think uh, consequences for actions, right? And I think 
we've been saying this in, in the education committee, that the parents need to be held accountable, the kids need to be held accountable, mm -hmm. and the administration and, and the teachers need to be account held accountable. You can't tie one arm behind your back and, and let, let them just do it. So we have to put it into to code to give them uh, the power and, and, and the ability to do that. You've mentioned a couple of times like an, an act against a teacher. Are there already things in place if there's an act against another student or is well, that e just kind of understood? Each BOE uh, within their county has their own policies on, on what they're doing. What we, the biggest complaint that we've got directly from the teachers and, and from the, uh, the unions who, who talk to the teachers is the teachers don't feel like the administration is backing them when they're saying we have an issue here hmm. um, and, and we don't want to kick the can down the road. We don't want to move the kid to another teacher's classroom immediately and, and have them do it. Right. There are certain um, things that we've got a study resolution, which again, um, that also passed where we we're finding out um, what it would cost to have an alternative school at the elementary level and at the senior level in every single County. Um, and, and trying to find a way to pay for that because I think we have a serious problem in, in West Virginia. And, um, you know, I'm not saying in Berkeley, um, but throughout the state. We have. I mean, we have an alternative school in Berkeley. We do. I mean, some of the smaller, I mean, I don't know how small the smallest school system is, but aren't there school systems with only 1,000 kids, 2,000 kids? Less than that, yeah. I mean, what, are they going to have three kids at <laughs> well, a, I mean, a trans school? We, 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 have, we have schools that are elementary through high school in West Virginia, one school. And those kids are traveling an hour and a half on a bus. So well, there are many different flavors and things that well, we're, we're trying to uh, do here. But at the same time, um, you look at something like uh, the Challenge Academy and the su success that they're having over there. Oh, yeah. Um, you, you've got to you, – that's a model that I think we should be copying well, in, in, in many well, parts. We can't, and we can't even really discuss the incredible waste of money on some very, very small school systems that have, you know, a superintendent, an assistant superintendent, a director of food, a – all sorts of things where if they combine three or four of those small school systems together, like RESA districts, then you end up with not duplication of services and you end up with less and with less less chiefs and more Indians and more right. money being spent educating the kids. And, and you, there are some counties that do not take one single penny from uh, from the, the taxpayer. The, the oil and gas industry pays 100 percent of their board of education. Um, and teachers, everything. So there are many different ways to do it and ways to look at it, um, and, and that's the, the things that we're fighting about or talking about. Uh, Mike, the vaccination bill that went through the House and then the Senate, I'm yeah. not sure to this day if the governor has signed it yet or not, but it lost most of its teeth as it went to the Senate. They took the religious exemptions out, and then the I guess the bishop of of the uh, Catholic Church in the state said that they would not waive the requirements in the Catholic schools. Well, in, in, I think the, int the original intent of the bill was to open up um, virtual schools to, you, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't, if you have a religious exemption or a religious, if you don't want your kids to be vaccinated for whatever reason, they got a medical, whatever it is, we shouldn't be punishing kids. So we wanted them to be able to attend virtual school. Mm -hmm. Uh, it got amended in House Judiciary, and it was added. Private schools could have the option as long as they publicized it and said, hey, this is what we're doing, and they had their plan. Then it came to the floor, and religious exemptions were added. I did speak against it because I am a Rotarian. I, you know, I've been speaking for 15 years on, on the polio vaccine. I understood where my colleagues were coming from, but I couldn't vote for that bill. Mm -hmm. So it went over to the Senate. The Senate removed the religious exemptions and put it back in the form of of, of what it came to the House floor on. Um, the original intent. The original intent. I voted for it. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know, I don't feel bad about if, if a parent doesn't want to vaccinate, that they should have the ability to go to virtual school. They still can't participate in public school activities or anything like that. Um, but they are still a taxpayer in, in West Virginia. And if, if it means that I know homeschooling can, can get expensive and it can be burdensome about, amongst some families, if it means a kid can get a better education, I'm all for it. So I ended up voting for that bill. What the governor does, I don't know. I mean, he still, as far as he, you know, he still hasn't signed he, it. He, uh, the last comment I saw was two days ago, and he said he hadn't made his mind up yet. So even in that amended form, I I know in talking uh, with our local health department officials, they are against 
that bill. Uh, there was, I think, Friday during our discussion of this, there was some criticism in our comment community that some people have medical reactions. Yep. Uh, the medical exemptions already existed, and those were not tampered with. They were, no. That this, if you have a medical problem yeah. with the vaccine, like Matt did when he was a kid, like my yeah. oldest son did, this does not mandate you get a vaccine no. if you have a medical reaction to it. Yeah, I think well, this bill just simply allows some people to go to virtual school. Now, the private schools, I don't see a lot of our private schools saying, hey, we're not going to require vaccines because now they can't play sports. Mm -hmm. um, now I still see a lot of – I still think 90% of our population is going to get vaccinated. Well, I mean – it, it was a red meat uh, on the uh, floor amendment that got a lot of attention, mm -hmm. and a lot of people had to vote for it because they, they're going up on the board. And they don't want to publicly be against a religious from, freedom. From what I read about, I guess it was about three weeks ago, when the outbreaks for measles started, and I think it's up to 17 states. It might be more since then. I don't know. But it, it's not, I think 94% was the figure that they quoted in a community. If you have 94% vaccination, then for the most part, you're yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, herd immunity can, it can be in the low 80s, really. But um, I, I think the latest stats is if you looked across the, the United States, 90%. 0.4% of our population is vaccinated. Which is probably the reason why we have outbreaks in 17 states. We, we do have, and it's usually w within large pockets, so um, a whole community decides not to get uh, vaccinated. Let's say um, we, we had uh, up in New York or Pennsylvania a couple of years back a polio outbreak because the whole community, a couple of hundred people living together on a combine or whatever it is, none of them were vaccinated. Commune. Commune, mm -hmm. yeah. How and do you fit 100 people on a combine? <laughs> no, no. Well, Dangerous. How many clowns no, can no. you fit in a car? There's a combine, too. <laughs> same, same, same meaning. They call uh, uh, so, you know, in that, it takes one person to go out into the community, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the, these diseases are very, very highly infectious. So um, you're going to see that more and more across the United States. Uh, final question for Mike. Go ahead, John. You had something there, or Matt? Well, no, I just, uh, I think it's crazy that we even had the debate whether kids can be unvaccinated and go to virtual school. I mean, I, I've been through a lot of Zoom meetings, and I have never caught anyone, anything from someone else on a Zoom meeting. No, uh, but the, the details matter, John. It, it's... It's the virtual school. Okay, but what happens when they want to play sports? What about chess club? What well, about band? Hey, about, I, fu I fully agree <laughs> yeah. that they're not allowed. You, can, you yeah. If you make that choice, you are then not allowed to do sports. But, You're not allowed to do band. Then, I agree with the, that. And then the argument back is, well, I go to church with these folks. I was going to uh, say, it, they're it, still in the community. They're, they're in You're the going community. to run into them at you know some so, point in time. I, so I see both sides of it, and that's where you sit on the floor for four and a half hours listening yeah. to the debate. And I know how I feel. I'm not going to convince the, the guy well, the, across the right. road well, the, to the change scary, his mind. But. The scary part is for the person who medically can't handle the vaccines, and then you have other people not getting it and by the, choice and them bringing that disease in that this person yeah. has no ability to be protected well, that, against. And, there, and there's the issue That's because the issue. you have people who can't, like, if, for instance, if, if you have uh, uh, had chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, from what Bill uh, and, and Doc McLaughlin were telling us, your immunity is now gone from your vaccine. So in how many people go through chemotherapy in this country? I, I, I'm pro-vaccine. I think yeah, vaccines I, are important, as you are. I, I, I do, too. But then you also have to look from the other side, and this is where it gets, you know, chicken pox. The chicken pox is highly infectious, but it doesn't really hurt anybody. It hurts you if you get it as an adult. So, you know, uh, my argument is for those core those core vaccines that have been around for 50, 60 years. Exactly. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Appreciate thank your you. time this morning. Thanks for having me.